Hello, I'm Dave Paza, Chief Science Officer of American Gene Technologies in Rockville, Maryland. We're a biotech company using lentiviral vectors to create uh, solutions for human disease. Today I'd like to introduce you to our company and talk about our program on functional cure for HIV. Our legal disclaimers are here because I'll make forward-looking statements during the talk. Uh, we have three uh, major areas of work in the company. One is on uh, uh, viral vectors and gene therapy for inborn errors of metabolism, in this case phenylketonuria. This program is advancing well with uh, orphan drug designation and preparing to have our first meetings with the FDA. We also have an important immuno-oncology program targeting solid tumors, again using lentiviral vectors to modify tumor metabolism and activate the natural gamma-delta T-cell response against these tumors. And finally, the topic for today is our, our program on curing HIV disease. Uh, this is a, uh, for chronically infected individuals who have been treated for at least two years with antiretroviral therapy to suppress the virus. And the product is a cell and gene therapy that is administered by infusion. And uh, I'll n talk a lot about this and how it works and why we're uh, very excited about it. So, as I mentioned, it's a cell and gene immunotherapy, and I'll distinguish this from other efforts in this area as I go along through the talk. This uh, product is designed to reinvigorate the host immune response against HIV, to create a natural response that's capable of attacking HIV and resolving it in much the way we do for many other viral diseases. The effort in this area is, is really characterized by these three bullet points. Our product reconstitutes the GAG-specific CD4 T cells. This is a population of T cells that's depleted early in HIV disease and not recovered despite prolonged therapy. We engineer T cells in this product to resist HIV infection themselves. This makes them more durable once we place them back into the body and also prevents them from releasing HIV if they were part of the viral reservoir. And our hope is that this product will restore the capacity for generating a natural cytotoxic T cell response and also may provoke, promote more rapid evolution and production of neutralizing, neutralizing antibodies. Sorry. So there have been many studies uh, on cell and gene therapy for HIV disease and I'll go through some of them and, uh, and highlight uh, some differences and similarities between our program. All of these have basic features in common. So they usually start with autologous PBMC that are removed from the body, purified and uh, engineered with some kind of viral vector or nucleic acid agent. Most of these in the past have targeted CCR5 genes, either by down-regulating expression of the gene or by deleting the gene itself. The preferred targets are PBMC and sometimes hematopoietic bone marrow precursor stem cells uh, that are targeted uh, to uh, downregulate CCR5 expression. Gene therapy cargos are delivered by viral vectors or naked RNA, and several different types of viral vectors have been used. And cell engraftment during the infusion step follows a non myeloablative conditioning with, with chemotherapeutic drugs like cytoxan or fludarabine to lower the lymphocyte count and create a more favorable environment for the introduction of the engineered cells. So here's a brief and incomplete list of uh, previous cell and gene therapy efforts in HIV disease. You can see that there's a broad range of them extending back a significant um, amount of time. And uh, so there, a lot of learning has been obtained from these uh, studies. And um, we have looked carefully at the results of all these efforts in order to find what we believe are gaps in the previous efforts and how we can fill those gaps. There has been a notable success that came from the study by the company Sangamo Biosciences, which used an adeno-5 virus vector to deliver a zinc finger nuclease capable of disrupting the CCR5 gene. And uh, in the original publication that's shown here, there were 12 people in the study. They all went through a structured treatment interruption. 11 failed and had to go back on therapy, and one had persistent control of viremia, which is now up to about five years at a very low level of viremia, and they remain so off their antiretroviral medication. This was an important uh, finger pointing forward in this field, 
and uh, really showed that there was possibility of altering the situation in HIV with gene therapy vectors. We just had to find the right way and to make these things potent and active in more people than just one out of 12. So AGT103T is the name of our product, and we consider this to be well differentiated from things that have gone on in the past, and, uh, and I'll explain that in a moment. There are three critical steps in the development of AGT103T. The first was to design a potent vector that could engineer CD4 T cells and prevent them from being eliminated from the body in the presence of HIV. Uh, this would make them durable and also prevent them from releasing virus if they were already infected. Second, we had to develop a reproducible process for enriching CD4 T cells that are needed specifically to drive HIV immunity. We selected the GAG-specific CD4 T cell target and developed a process which has gone far beyond anything known in literature in order to enrich and expand this specific cell subset. And finally, we had to learn how to preferentially transduce only those GAG-specific CD4 cells with our AGT103 lentivirus vector. The reason being that CCR5, which is downregulated by our vector, is important in many other forms of immunity, including immunity to several other families of virus. We did not want to downmodulate CCR5 on the bulk of all CD4 T cells. We wanted to focus this effort only on the CD4 T cells needed to respond to HIV. So the vector is depicted in this cartoon. It's a simple uh, lentivirus vector, uh, third generation self inactivating vector, as we say, uh, containing three microRNAs. Uh, that are uh, attacking the messenger RNA for CCR5, for HIV VIT, VIF, and for HIV TAT. And this, my, this vector endows cells with a very uh, substantial protection against HIV and of both CCR5 and CXCR4 tropic types, but does not alter the cellular response to peptides, so antigen receptor responses are intact, and uh, has no other visible effect on the CD4 T cell phenotype. We conducted a very extensive series of characterizations of this vector and how it was working in order to develop a pharmacology section for our IND application. In the, in the upper levels, you see that we conducted extensive tests to address the specificity of the CCR5 microRNA itself. And part of this is due to the fact that CCR5 and the gene for CCR2 overlap, have uh, overlapping sequences. And so we had to show that our microRNA downregulates only CCR5 and has no impact on CCR2. We also had to, con to demonstrate effective protection of cells by a, a CCR5 tropic HIV, and that was done in JC53 cells, as you see. And to go further, showing that this vector, because of the anti-HIV microRNAs encoded in the vector, also protected primary CD4 cells against challenge by a CXCR4 tropic HIV. And lastly, using an in vitro model of latent infection, uh, we showed that transduction of those cells with AGT103 vector also inhibited them from releasing HIV. So we accomplished all the goals we had posed originally for the potency and mechanism of action for our lentivirus vector. The next was to figure out a way to put this vector into a cell process. And what I'm showing here is a cartoon summarizing the major steps in the cell process. So we begin by leukapheresis of an HIV positive individual, as I mentioned before, uh, greater than two years on suppressive antiretroviral therapy. And using a Milteni prodigy machine, we purify those cells and uh, go conduct the first few steps of the cell process. Those steps include antigen-specific stimulation of the PBMC obtained from this uh, purification. That involves stimulating with overlapping peptides representing the HIV gag polyprotein. Second, we purify these cells to enrich only for the CD4 positive cell subset that, that does two things. It removes cells which inhibit growth of those CD4s, and it also reduces the number of target cells for a subsequent transduction event. The transduction comes next, 
That's transduction of these CD4s with AGT103. The cells are then placed in a static culture for eight days, harvested, purified, cryopreserved, and ready for infusion into a clinical trial participant. Along the bottom of this slide, I'm showing you some sample data for a typical process. So if we start with CD4 T cells from most HIV positive individuals, you get a number similar to what's shown here. The frequency of the GAG specific cells is about 0 0.05 to 0.07%. So five per 10,000 CD4 cells. Uh, we get a very efficient transduction efficiency, as you see here. It's about 30% overall, but it's about 80% in the target cells, and you'll see how those numbers are derived in a minute. And we end up with harvesting about 4 billion total CD4 T cells, which is 4 billion cells of which almost all are CD4. And in this case, in this particular product, now 14.8% of them were HIV specific. So we've raised the frequency of these cells from 0.055% in the starting blood to 14.8% in the product. And as you can see on the far right, that, um, that means that uh, if we infuse those HIV resistant and HIV specific T cells, meaning they're transduced, now we end up with about three times 10 to the ninth cells in this product. And if we infuse those into, back into the original donor, that would comprise about 3% of total body CD4 cells. So we think that's a meaningful change in the level of these CD4, GAG specific CD4 T cells in the body. And our objective for moving forward into the clinical trial is to test that hypothesis about the potency of this product. This process is quite reproducible, as you can see in this table. And what I've highlighted along the bottom is the yield of the HIV-specific CD4 T cells in the final product um, as a factor of cells times 10 to the 9. So you range from about 1.4 down to about 0 0.34 cells per uh, 10, 10 to the 9, uh, cells times 10 to the 9, sorry, in the final product. Uh, with one particular uh, donor there not giving a successful product yield, and we've tested that donor more than once, and they continue to give unsuccessful yields. And we know more about this, but we don't have time for talking about that today. But you can see we're consistently in the 10 to the 8th to 10 to the 9 total number of CD4 T cells in the final product. And, uh, and we have done about three times this many products in total. And these data are highly representative of our experience. To give you a little bit more uh, uh, indication of what's Going on in these products, I've taken a figure from a recent publication in molecular therapy. And so you can see that along the top in panel A, we show you the process, the abbreviated process, and then in panel B, C, D, and E, some details about the nature of those cells. So you can see in B that there's an overall increase in the total number of CD4 cells during this, um, during this process. And we can actually show as we go through that uh, that increase is largely due, as you see in panel D, to the increase of the GAG-specific CD4 T cells. So the remaining cells, non-GAG specific, have not proliferated to a significant extent, but the GAG-specific cell proliferation is tremendous. And as you see in panel E, this results in a product highly enriched for T effector memory cells. Uh, panel F shows you the um, cytokine expression of these T effector memory cells, and as expected, we get a lot of single cytokine, double cytokine, and even triple cytokine expressing cells, uh, and with the massive accumulation of cytokine expression coming af in the after expansion case. So this product looks exactly what you would like it to be. It's a T, T effector memory enriched population, highly specific for HIV gag protein. So to return back to our cartoon and to make a simple way to summarize this product is that <clears throat> we manufacture AGT103 through this semi-automated cell process, which takes about 11 days. And we start with about less than 1 million gag specific CD4 cells in the total product. And we end up with something in excess of 1 billion and uh, that is a very substantial difference. That creates the, um, 
the argument that this is a novel product and a real immunotherapeutic. And as you know, clinical research is hypothesis testing, and this product will allow us to address our hypothesis that HIV disease can be effectively combated if you can have a substantial number of gag-specific CD4 T cells that are also resistant to HIV-mediated depletion. And as I note along the bottom, <clears throat> infusing this number of cells will routinely give you a greater than tenfold increase in the total number of gag-specific CD4 T cells, and we hope that moves this population into an effective range of the ability to control um, HIV immunity and to generate a, a potent product for combating HIV disease. Now, I mentioned earlier in the talk that there had been a substantial experience of other investigators trying to develop cell and gene therapy products for the treatment of HIV disease. And uh, in general, these products involved bulk CD4 T cells harvested from blood that then were then manipulated ex vivo and returned to the body as a bulk population. And I mentioned that that's what really differentiates our program from previous programs in that we wanted to generate a true immunotherapy. And the program, the products before that have made bulk modifications of CD4 T cells we characterize as an effort to generate replacement immune systems. So how, do, how were in replacement immune systems thought to work? Well, you would remove cells, a fraction of the total body uh, T cells, you would engineer them ex vivo and put them back into the body. And remember, these experiments are largely done, at least currently done, with uh, trial participants that have been on antiretroviral therapy and maintain their antiretroviral therapy through the, uh, pro through the process of cell infusion. So the idea was that these CD4 cells would survive in vivo and there would be a, an erosive activity of HIV that would slowly degrade the non-modified CD4 T cells and over time the, um, the modified T cells, which were HIV resistant, would slowly take over and replace the non-engineered cell population. And uh, we think that there are specific uh, challenges to this hypothesis, especially the fact that to go from normal CD4 levels to let's say 200 CD4 per microliter, that would be characteristic of AIDS, takes more than 10 years on average in untreated people. And it's unclear how long this process would take in treated individuals. So it was also unclear how you would monitor the effect of this type of therapy over a long period of time. This is quite different from our effort, as shown in the bottom, to do a reconstitution. And reconstitutions are methods to overcome a key immunological defect. And in this case, we identified that key defect as the absence and failure to recover HIV-specific CD4 T cells. So in individuals treated for 10, 20, or even longer years with antiretroviral therapy, the uh, very, very low frequencies of HIV-specific CD4 cells are not improved over that long period of time. So new cells may be being created during that time and being expected to take over and to create a, a larger memory cell population but some process that's ongoing, even, even in the presence of therapy, is con reducing their numbers and preventing their expansion and preventing their normal function. So our goal was to overcome this problem. So some of those replacement immune system efforts are listed on this page. And as I said, they covered a wide range of different approaches. And, uh, and made a lot of progress in understanding um, the real dynamics of HIV, what could be done, and what could be, done, what could be expected of engineered CD4 T cells. Particularly the second one, which is called CD4 zeta chain uh, modification. This was in a sense the first CAR-T experiment ever performed because it was putting a new type of receptor on T cells expecting those T cells to find HIV through this receptor and to kill them through cytotoxicity. 
And so this is a pioneer that not only advanced our understanding of HIV, but really was a first step in the whole CAR-T revolution that led to cancer. And this paper, as were others on this page, are the genesis of the mind of Carl June, who was one of the pioneers in CAR-T therapy. The City of Hope in Duarte, California, and particularly John Rossi there, uh, have uh, conducted a number of important studies in HIV disease to trying to develop their own brand of cell and gene therapy. Another company that actually was operating uh, here in Rockville, Maryland was called Varexis. Varexis uh, developed a, a, a lentivirus vector called VRX496T, which expressed an antisense RNA against the envelope glycoprotein region of HIV. They conducted extensive studies in uh, HIV positive individuals and showed that this vector and these kind of modified T cells were extremely stable, very safe, and uh, had caused very few adverse effects upon infusion. Now their vector failed to increase CD4 count or to suppress HIV in the long run, but we learned a lot about delivery and dynamics of these cells from this particular program. And combining this program with the ones above really told us that we can expect five, 10 and year and even longer duration of genetically modified CD4 cells after infusion. And the last one is the Sangamo uh, SB728T product that I mentioned before, which was the bulk modification of CD4 T cells using an adenovirus to deliver zinc finger nuclease protein. So if we just take the last one, the Sangamo one, which is representative of these replacement immune system efforts. And we look at it through our unique perspective, which is that the GAG-specific CD4 T cells are what we are really after. And we want a product that delivers and sustains this part of the immune system. Why? Because we know that these cells will drive all other functions of the immune system and HIV targeting and removing them is the key way that the, this virus disabled immunity, established long-term infection and caused disease progression. So on the left side, I've used uh, numbers from Sangamo's own publications to estimate how many gag-specific CD4 cells they deliver in a typical product. So their dose is not, uh, not dissimilar to ours. Both are delivering about five times 10 to the ninth CD4 cells. When you use the zinc finger nuclease modification, about 30% of cells have some modification, but only 10% of cells have a biallelic modification of CCR5. And we know that that biallelic modification is what's really needed to protect cells from HIV infection. And of course, this would have no impact on CXCR4 tropic viruses. So the biallelically modified CD4 T cells are about five times 10 to the eight. And if we calculate those based on a 0.07% abundance of GAG-specific CD4 cells, we see that that Sangamo product in the five times 10 to the nine cells delivered contained about 3.5 times 10 to the five GAG-specific CD4 T cells. If you look in the right column, I've repeated that calculation based on uh, our actual numbers for AGT103T. So we again deliver about five times 10 to the nine CD4 cells. And the frequency of transduced cells is about 17% on average. And the frequency of GAG specific CD4 T cells is about 17%. <clears throat> and I make a comment here that the transduction is extremely specific for the GAG specific CD4 T cells. There is some bystander transduction, but the vast majority of the vector ends up in this target cell population. So using these numbers, we know now that our products contain on average about 8.5 times 10 to the eight GAG specific CD4 T cells. And this means the AGT 103 T product is at least 2000 times more potent than this product from, from Sangamo Biosciences in terms of this specific target cell subset. And again, we need to do hypothesis testing in clinical research our hypothesis focuses on reconstitution of this subset. These numbers give us confidence that this product uh, has the characteristics that are worthy of testing in a clinical trial. <clears throat> so we're very happy to uh, tell everyone that our IND was approved in August 2020, 
and we're wrapping up the last details of site initiation and other uh, activities in order to move into the clinic. Um, I've shown you on the left side some of the key players at AGT and our collaborators at uh, NIH, NIAID uh, that uh, worked hard to characterize this product. Uh, we received many clinical samples from the Washington Health Institute in Washington, D.C. Uh, with the help of Dr. Jose Borden and one of our uh, collaborators at the University of Maryland Medical School is Sham Kotalil, uh, who's well known for HIV and other human viral uh, disease solutions. We are lucky to have a very great group of advisors. David Hardy and Ellie Benaim were both uh, medical officers on previous cell and gene therapy trials in HIV, and John Rossi was an absolute pioneer in this field. And uh, our uh, CMO support is listed there. So thank you very much for listening and uh, wish us the best in our upcoming clinical trial.